Hello. Thank you, everyone, that you joined our seminar, today's seminar. Uh, today, we are glad to have with us uh, Vasilis Labropoulos. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of uh, the New Hellenic Chair of Konstantinos uh, Kavafis at the University of Michigan. And uh, the title of his talk is The Tragedy of Autonomy in the Modern Theater of Liberation. Um, and the format of the discussion will be, uh, will have uh, a talk by Vasilis. Uh, he will speak about one hour and then uh, the floor will be open for questions. Um, thank you that you joined. And yeah, <laughs> let's, thank Vasilis. I would like to thank the Greek office of the Rosa Luxemburg Institute for sponsoring this seminar series, and doctors uh, George Souvlis and Rosa Vasilaki for inviting me to contribute. I congratulate them for this wonderful project. I know how much work is uh, required, and they have done a great job. The title of the talk is The Tragedy of Autonomy in the Modern Theater of Liberation, and therefore I'm going to talk about liberation, I'm not going to talk about autonomy and about tragedy. And there will, be, there will be some signposts in my talk so that you will be able to uh, follow it. <coughs> First, post-colonial self-determination in the 1960s. Since the main topic of this series of seminars is liberation, I shall talk about what was arguably the last period of liberation on a global scale, decolonization in the 1960s. During that period, many national liberation movements, especially in Africa, established post-colonial states and gained international legitimacy and recognition. The decade started with the monumental breakthrough and I will be quoting <coughs> Adam, uh, three um, uh, political scientists, Adam DiTaccio, Gary Wilder, and uh, Brad Simpson for a couple of pages. Um, in 1960, 17 African states joined the United Nations, marking the high point of decolonization in the black Atlantic world. As a bloc, they led the effort to secure passage of the revolution declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples. That was in 1960. The declaration described foreign rule as a violation of human rights, reiterated the right to self-determination, and called for the immediate end of all forms of colonial rule. It offered a complete repudiation of foreign rule and rejected any prerequisites for the attainment of independence. Thus, self-determination was transformed from principle to human right. This global growth of national independence also brought to the forefront debates about the meaning of what liberation had entailed and achieved. Gary Wilder, quote, they often focused on the meaning of self-rule. Public struggles over the shape of the post-world world questioned the meaning of terms long treated as synonyms. Freedom, liberty, emancipation, independence, sovereignty, self-determination, and autonomy. So what did each one of them mean in the new international um, political framework? The exercises of collective self-rule in these new post-colonial states raised many issues like the following. First, is self-rule a general principle or a human right? Is it also a political, economic, and cultural right? Third, is it an act such a plebiscite or in an ongoing process, such as the holding of elections. Four, who has the right to self-rule? Individuals, ethnic groups, national groups, all people living with cer within certain boundaries, 
or other human configurations? And last, who or what is a people or a nation? Thus, liberation from colonialism generated major questions about post-colonial self-determination. Following Western models, post-colonial states sought to become homogeneous nation states. Um, Brad Simpson, many colonial states, especially in Africa, had arbit arbitrary boundaries bearing little resemblance to the actual dispersal of ethnic, linguistic, or cultural groups. Forging and maintaining a national identity across diverse ethnic and linguistic lines was therefore a priority for many post-colonial regimes, which viewed strong single-party states as a means to an end." Unquote. However, as soon as it was launched, the creation of a pluralistic nation-state was met with staunch internal resistance. In the decade after the height of decolonization in 1960, the idea of the post-colonial state as the site of a politics of citizenship that would accommodate racial, ethnic, and religious pluralism was called into question as movements from below resisted and repudiated the majoritarian homogenizing and exclusionary tendencies that appeared embedded in the structure of the nation state. On the one hand, the ideal of the nation state, that was the uh, <coughs> contemporary Western model, and on the other hand, uh, the pluralistic claims of <coughs> various groups within this newly established state. There were two major internal challenges by minority groups to homogenizing self-determination, both of them manifestations of stasis, of civil strife. One was dissent. Does the right to self-rule include demo democratic participation? Get at you, quote, State concerns about instability fueled suspicion of domestic dissent and motivated anti-colonial nationalists to take an increasingly hostile and punitive stance towards domestic political opposition. In the context of perceived state weakness, dissent and opposition came to represent instability and subversion which sanctioned state repression. Can we afford, as a new state, to have um, uh, uh, dissent and to have internal disagreement and demo democratic pluralism? The second uh, uh, manifestation of stasis was secession. Does the right to self-rule include seceding from established and recognized states? that is, liberation from liberated populations. Can minorities begin to say within the newly established uh, uh, state that they want their own independence? Um, Simpson, as UN member states move to condemn colonialism and enshrine self-determination as a human right in the early 1960s, and as decolonization accelerated in earnest, so too did worries that cascading self-determination claims within anti-colonial movements might lead to increased pressure for secession." Unquote. To, to well-known examples of such um, attempts at secession was the Congo crisis, 1960 to 65, a period of civil wars that began almost immediately after the Congo became independent from Belgium and included the failed secession of the Katanga province. And the second example, the failed secession of Nigerians, Nigeria's eastern region under the name of the Republic of Biafra, 1967 to 70. A succession of se cessation crises such as these two 
foregrounded the limits of self-determination as a guarantor of post-colonial sovereignty. The loss of trust in the sovereignty of post-colonial states resulted in the crisis of nation building. The UN, with African members in the lead, repeatedly condemned attempts by secessionist movements to redraw the borders of often fragile multi-ethnic states, and it explicitly or tacitly authorized the Congo, Nigerian, and other countries threatened by such movements to take actions necessary to preserve their territorial integrity. Thus, anti-colonial nationalism failed to attend to internal pluralism and it sanctioned authoritarianism in the name of this, the nation. This failure may be part of a larger phenomenon. Quoting Victor Figueroa, disappointment with the results of revolutionary anti-colonial practices, particularly with the way they often reproduce the unfair structures of exploitation and exclusion that they were fighting in the first place has been pervasive among colonial writers and intellectuals. Moreover, and that's the crucial sentence, that disappointment and sheer exhaustion are not recent, but rather have been parcel of all revolutions from France to the United States and Russia and beyond." Unquote. Why am I was looking at the uh, at post-colonial independence in the 60s? <clears throat> the antinomy of autonomy. My interest in the challenges of post-colonial governance is part of my broader research into the dilemmas of post-revolutionary autonomy. I focus on the ruptures of linear time and radical beginnings triggered by revolutions on the openings of socio-political space created when people rise against ruling authority to demand freedom. Are, these are modern questions of authorization and constitution that have been preoccupying political thinkers from Sorel, Luxembourg, Schmidt, and Gramsci in the early 20th century to Sartre, Camus, and Merleau-Ponty in the 1940s to Fanon, Aren, and Castoriadis in the 1960s, to Foucault, Habermas, Lyotard, and Unger in the 1980s, to Negri, Badiou, Mouffe, and Ranciere in the 2000s. More specifically, I focus on the antinomies of civic autonomy, on the fact that freedom must be self-policed. I treat the fundamental idealist antinomy between freedom and necessity as the antinomy of archi, as beginning and rule, the double meaning of archi, revolution and institution, constituent and constituted, authorization and authority, the people and government, polemos and polis. A discussion of the antinomy of autonomy takes us back to philosopher Immanuel Kant. For Kant, freedom was the fundamental problem of philosophy and the great problem of the modern world. Kantian freedom means m the moral freedom of autonomy, autonomy as self-determination, free will, will under modern law, will being a law to itself, will obeying its law for its own sake. Kantian autonomy is therefore a duty and a submission. I am free to obey, I'm free to obey, okay. by own law, but still to obey. Autonomy, I'm sorry, the only way to be free is to be autonomously, is to autonomously prescribe for myself the duty of autonomy, which duty is the free submission of my morally self-legislative will to its own law. Thus, the paradox. The realization of freedom requires obedience to universal law. 
the inherent contradiction of autonomia, autonomia is captured in its very etymology. Can freedom and rule coexist? Can a collectivity be free and at the same time live under the rule of law? This contradiction makes freedom tragic. As we saw, this was the challenge faced by post-colonial states in the 1960s. The concept of tragic freedom has been central to critical philosophy from Kant to post-anarchism. Its earliest concise articulation was the paradox of autonomy, the hugely influential third antinomy of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, 1781. In it, the work of practical, of moral reason, is to overcome the antinomy of autonomy, its inherent heter heteronomy, by preserving and reconciling freedom and obedience, even to make them mutually reinforcing. The tragic idea emerges as precisely what escapes Kant's transcendental reason, the unresolved antinomy, the self-destructive autonomy, the contradictory self-legislation. Within it appear several pressing questions. What happens when the demands of self-governance begin to impede self-determination? Above all, can freedom defy the rule of autonomy? And now we come to Friedrich Schelling. In the tenth of his philosophical letters on dogmatism and criticism, which is 1795, several years after uh, the first critic, he discusses a dramatic antinomy. He changes, he takes the, the Kantian antinomy and moves it to a Greek tragedy, um, Oedipus. How was Greek reason, asks Schelling, how was Greek reason able to bear the contradictions of its tragedy? What rendered contradiction bearable in the eyes of the Greeks? Oedipus is an illustration of this contradiction. A mortal destined by fate to become a criminal, struggling against himself, <laughs> struggling himself against this fate, and nonetheless, terribly punished for a crime which was the work of destiny. Thus we have a mortal struggle between freedom and destiny. To manifest one's freedom even though the loss of this freedom, through the loss of this freedom itself. That is, in Schelling's view, how freedom and necessity are reconciled. If Kant thought that a free will is a moral one, Schelling believes that a free will is a guilty one that maintains its moral integrity. Freedom consists not in the self-governance of autonomy, but in the futile revolt of autonomy against heteronomy. We are doomed to be heteronomous, but we can still declare and, and seek our in vain, of course, our autonomy. This approach takes Oedipus as its prototype. Bernard Yack, in, uh, in the book The Longing for Total Revolution, talks about the Kantian left. The Kantian left, to him, uh, is longing for a total revolution by taking um, uh, 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 Kant and trying to uh, put him into social and political practice. Uh, while Kant asks us to be to act autonomously, the Kantian left demands that we realize our, that we practice our autonomy. And this Kantian left, according to Bernard Jack, is uh, the most creative and influential German philosophers from Fichte to Hegel. My next section, therefore, is the, tra the tragic in political theory. Since the German idealists, the idea of the tragic has acquired philosophical authority and great thematic range. To our time, political and social theory continue to explore antinomies in tragic 
terms. The Kantian uh, antinomy is no longer uh, reconcilable, it's only practiced um, uh, as uh, um, uh, a tragic uh, quest. Just a few representative titles, which many of you, or which all of you will recognize. Um, David Ritchie, The Tragedy of Political Science, 1984. Christopher Rocco, Tragedy and Enlightenment. Uh, Bert uh, van den Bink, The Tragedy of Liberalism. Richard Ned Lebeau, The Tragic Vision of Politics, 2003. Paul Kotman, A Politics of the Scene, 2008. Um, Viv Sony, Morning Happiness, Narrative and the Politics of Modernity, 2010. Tina Chanter, Who is Antigone, The Tragic Marginalization of Slavery, 11. Mark Chow, Greek Tragedy and Contemporary Democracy. It's a very long list, actually it's three pages. Um, uh, that shows the tremendous currency of the idea of uh, tragic uh, um, uh, mobilized within the social and the political sphere. Thinkers from Marx to Arendt and Camus have used tragedy to implode revolution. Uh, I'll give you three examples. Uh, Raymond Williams, the British uh, literary theorist, uh, he says, since the time of the French Revolution, the idea of tragedy can be seen as, in different ways, a response to a culture of conscious change and movement. The action of tragedy and the action of history have been consciously connected, and in the connection have been seen in new ways. The tragic action, in its deepest sense, is not the confirmation of disorder, but its experience, its comprehension, and its resolution. In our own time, this action is general, and its common name is revolution. David Scott, the anthropologist, the American anthropologist, says, Tragedy as a way of thinking about the fragility of the project of founding freedom and the act that it has, by and large, eluded the modern aspiration to revolution. Tragedy is the price of freedom. And always the risk of tragedy more present, more burdensome, and more consequential than in the upheaval of revolution, the event of modern political action par excellence. Nowhere is the price of freedom more dearly paid than in the collapse or failure of revolution when everything has been risked in action and everything has been lost to it. And uh, last, Alberto Toscano, the political theorist, um, he talks about politics in a tragic key. The modern tragedy par excellence is to be found in the revolutionary process. The process of revolution could be conceived as ineliminably tragic. Contradictions become tragic only from the standpoint of revolution and its practice. When we assume that a position outside the contradictions of modernity or the dialectic of enlightenment is impossible, the result is the tragic form. And now about the post-colonial tragic, since we talk about um, the tragic in political thought, we also encount encounter it often in post-colonial experience and thought. And one figure that I will be, a major figure that I will be talking about is uh, MSSR, the uh, intellectual and politician from Martinique. In 1969, 
MSSR gave this succinct account of autonomy from epic liberation to tragic possibility. Quote, freedom is great. Winning one's freedom is great. But once freedom is obtained, one must know what to do with it. Liberation is epic, but tomorrows are tragic. David Scott, whom I just mentioned, suggests that, quote, where the anti-colonial narrative is cast as an epic romance, as the great progressive story of an oppressed and victimized people's struggle, from despair to triumph under heroic leadership, the tragic narrative is cast as a dramatic confrontation between contingency and freedom, between human will and its conditioning limits. That's uh, David Scott's famous uh, um, revisionary uh, understanding of postcolonialism, not as an epic that uh, 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 leads to um, uh, triumph through with the support of um, heroic leadership, but as a tragic narrative. The Caribbean tragic politics of revolutionary and anti-imperialist enactments of sovereignty search for new ways of exercising sovereignty and autonomy. And here we come to the central place of my talk, which is Haiti, IT. Haiti is the preeminent case of Caribbean tragic politics of revolution. The paradoxes of freedom in post-colonial Haiti have been often discussed in the context of the antinomy of autonomy. They were manifested from the moment of the nation's founding notably in the authoritarian structures of governance established for the emancipated colony and young state. And I have a couple of quotes from Doris Garraway about Haitian tragedy. Yet if the Haitian project of emancipation proved to be a paradox, as paradoxical as that of the French Revolution, this was a paradox supported in large part by the very universal categories in which it was proclaimed. And that's the specific uh, Haitian paradox from the very beginning of the autonomy. She argues, uh, uh, Garraway, that the discourse of freedom and the practice of authoritarianism in the Haitian revolution, together they evidence the profound antinomies of the discourse of universalism itself rendering it potentially problematic as a discourse of radical emancipation. <coughs> How can a radical emancipation of slaves uh, in the name of universalism uh, enact um, in the new state uh, authoritarian measures? The paradox of Haitian revolutionary discourse consist in the coexistence of two types of universalism. A radically extensive universalism of the rights of man, hence the emancipation, and a more exclusionary form that denied Hessians and other non-Europeans cultural authority in the international sphere and justified their political and social subjugation at home. The truth of this paradox is that the first ideology legitimated the second. Now that we are free, we can be slaves to our free state. As a radical extension of the process of enlightenment, the Haitian Revolution was both a grandiose success and a failure. Since Haitian slaves could participate in this global discursive sphere only by asserting their rights through violence, they ultimately remain trapped within the logic of the very will to power that the public use of intersubjective communicative reason in the Enlightenment hoped to overcome. Nick Nesbitt writes, the contradiction between an absolute fidelity 
to the universal abolition of slavery and a defense of, on the other hand, in the free state, a defense of paternalistic, militaristic forms of agrarian plantocracy in the name of the state and independence. This conflict was structurally endemic to Saint-Domingue, Saint which became Haiti. And now we come to tragedy itself, the theatrical genre. In security, in his series of lectures, Security, Territory, and Population, Foucault says that classical theater from Shakespeare to Racine is basically organized around the coup d'etat. I propose that starting with Romanticism, theater is organized around the revolution. Modern theater stages the antinomies of civic autonomy as a tragic agon, agon, the tragedy of revolutionary governance. It dramatizes moments of extreme dilemmas. It dramatizes irreconcilable contradictions of legitimacy as contestation intrinsic to the revolution. Modern theater is rich in historical and imaginary figures and events pertaining to revolution. And here are some examples that we all know. Philip II of Spain in Schiller's Don Carlos, emperors like Boris Godunov in uh, Pushkin and Mussorgsky, presidents like uh, Kapodistria in Kazantzakis and Lumumba in Césaire's season in the Congo, Revolutionaries like Marat and Toussaint Louverture, militants in Brecht's measures taken in Heiner Miller's mission in Tony Negri's swarm, as well as terrorists in Camus the Just, uh, outlaws in Wordsworth borderers, and uprisings like uh, Hauptmann's The Weavers and Günther Grass's The Plebeians Rehearse the Uprising. In my project, I bring into a dialogue political theory and tragedy, the most political of all literary genres in which many theories have expressed so strong interest. We have in writings on tragedy itself, uh, Carl Schmitt on Shakespeare, Castoriadis on Aeschylus, Badiou on Racine, Tony Negri on Eurigid Euripides, and of course, Butler on Sophocles and so on. I argue that modern tragedy has as one of its central topics the ethico-political dilemmas of rebellion, namely revolutionary beginnings caught between limitless self-authorization and self-limiting rule. Tragedy stages the drama of the Greek archi in its double meaning of beginning and rule and asks whether self-rule may control itself, whether radical autonomy may limit itself. Thus, it explores the inherent antinomy of autonomia captured in its very etymology. Can freedom and rule coexist? How can a collectivity be free and at the same time live under the rule of law? How can a constitution be both enabling and limiting? Modern tragedy is interested in the contradictions of the revolt. The extraordinary event of a collective starts turning, I'm sorry. The extraordinary event of a collective start turns tragic when the revolt faces the demands of the legitimacy of rule, when the constituting power seeking self-rule needs to justify its own way of rule. At that point, it discovers that in self-determination in here, both beginning and rule. Tragedy stages the problems of a self-instituting society that would operate without ultimate guarantees and would live constantly with the need for self-legitimation. By following the transition of revolt from a constituting to a constituted power, 
it reflects on what it means to institute a political community. At the extraordinary moment of revolution, collective autonomy is engaged in a new founding. A self-instituting society will be making now its own norms. But what, but what will their foundation be? The tragedy of revolution, of the absolute beginning and the possible justification of its groundless actions, dramatizes the search for the legitimacy of revolutionary justice. By staging an agonism of judgments, tragedy dramatizes the dilemmas of justice in a political society founded on freedom and radical immanence. And now we talk, we'll talk about post-colonial tragedy. What is interesting is that uh, not only the tragic as we saw, but tragedy itself has been produced <coughs> uh, and discussed a lot in a post-colonial context. I'll give you a few uh, examples, different um, um, uh, approaches. Uh, Timothy Rice, in his book Against Autonomy, 2002, uh, in a very narrow-minded view, sees tragedy and the tragic as, quote, means of cultural dominion. He's the only one who says that uh, it's wrong in a post-colonial context to use any concepts derived from tragedy and the tragic because that's uh, a new um, intellectual and, and scholarly colonialism. To set non-Western stories onto tragedy and the tragic, he says, is to use cultural power to remove peoples from their own present. So um, post-colonials should tell uh, their own stories in their own way only. Uh, this has been basically a view that um, uh, uh, people found um, uh, uh, uninteresting, uh, and on the contrary, the view that generated a lot of continu continues to uh, generate a lot of discussion is that of of David Scott that I mentioned, uh, where he says that tragedy uh, uh, helps us employ uh, uh, the postcolonial the, the revolution, the anti-colonial revolution, and the postcolonial predicament uh, exactly because. In contrast to the romance of the epic triumph, it opens our eyes and our problematic to um, dilemmas and internal contradictions. Greg Graham, in the book Postcolonial Tragedy, Jamaica and South Africa in Comparative Perspective, argues that democratic political tragedy is a feature of the recent attempts to establish viable democratic societies in post-colonies. Uh, and he also discusses uh, Michael Manley and Len Nelson Mandela, as he calls them, tragic leadership figures, um, and traces the tragic course from solidarity and hope to despair under the weight of neoliberal regimes that seem to eventually prevail in the post-colony. Tina Chanter, in the book Who's Antigone, suggests that post-colonial dramatists have turned repeatedly to Greek tragedy in order to articulate predicaments that are fraught with the burden of drawing on a tradition that has been imposed by cultural and military dictate, and yet which is turned against itself under the pens of playwrights like such as Arthur Fugard and Femi Osofisan. Tragic commitments, including those of empire and colonialism, are thereby made to subvert themselves, a more interesting use of the <coughs> uh, tragic model. Samuel Durant, in, in an art, in a, a paper called uh, Trauma, Tragedy, and the Postcolonial Novel, notes that Shinua Akebe wrote that if we are to survive as a nation, then we need to grasp the meaning of our 
tragedy, that's Achebe. He comments that to become a nation, to move beyond mere survival, we Nigerians and by extension Africans must grasp the tragic patterning of the events that will have come to constitute, quote, our history. In retelling our history as tragedy, we come to experience our being in common. Um, in the face of failure of, of the failure of decolonization, a message there declared, we are in tragedy. And, and Julie Garanty discusses postcolonial writers who demonstrate, she says, the importance of rewriting the history of the nation as tragedy instead of as legend, which would be again a local um, idiom. She shows how they remember and rework the revolutionary pasts of postcolonial nations by translating mourning into tragic performances that bridge the gap between theater and theory. Um, Many recent, uh, many recent books of uh, uh, literary theory um, uh, discuss uh, post-colonial tragedy, that is, uh, um, its literary manifestations, by discussing a number of genres, not only theater, but the novel, uh, the short story, movies, and so on. So they uh, cover a wide range, range of cultural production. The most recent book came out uh, last year by Otto Quason. It's called Tragedy in Postcolonial Literature. He says, the key problem in the postcolonial world is the status of ethical choice in phases of trans transition when the old order must be changing, but the new order has not yet taken its place. It is at this conjuncture of historical transition and problematic ethical choice that I want to situate my exploration of postcolonial tragedy, says Otto Quason. <clears throat> but I'm going to focus on tragedy itself, on the genre of the theatrical genre on the stage and especially plays that take place in, during the Haitian Revolution. For many playwrights, to put it very basically, for many playwrights, as you will see, um, what Thebes was for ancient Athens, for the ancient um, Athenian uh, uh, tragedians, uh, Haiti has been for their work. That heterotopia, uh, that exemplary heterotopia where we can, where they can uh, stage uh, the drama of revolution and the antinomies of uh, autonomy. Haitian Revolution, the one and only, unprecedented, uh, discussed, uh, unfortunately, to a very limited, almost non-existent extent uh, last year in Greece, while it would have been the best uh, comparative um, uh, ground. The Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, has been often presented in terms of tragedy and the tragic. The subject has been attracting theatrical interest since the end of the 18th century, since the time it was really happening. From, this, from 1796 through 1975, let's say two centuries, a total of 63 plays concerned with the Haitian Revolution were 
either performed or published from Africa, the Caribbean, Europe, to the United States. States. The Haitian Revolution engendered more plays by black authors than any other single event in the history of the race. <clears throat> Between 1893 and 1984, over a dozen black dramatists have turned out plays dealing with aspects of this revolution. Some take place during the revolution itself, others during the postcolonial years. Uh, Errol Hill says, to African Americans, the Haitian Revolution seems destined to become what the Trojan War was to the Greeks, an inexhaustible source of heroic and legendary stories that will, for a long time to come, supply the raw material for inspiring black drama. Some of these plays uh, oh, now that uh, I, I'm going to concentrate on such plays, tragedies taking place in Haiti in the 1960s, returning to the decade where we started. Uh, famous writers write, playwrights, writers write intriguing tragedies during that decade. It's the great decade of decolonization. Edward Glissant writes Monsieur Toussaint in 61. Derek Walcott writes Drums and Colors in 61. Enrique Buenaventura writes The Tragedy of King Christophe in 1961. Lorraine Hansberry, the American playwright, writes Toussaint in 1961. M.S. Ezer, as we will soon see, writes his own tragedy of King Christophe in 63. Uh, C.L.R. James uh, revise, uh, rev revises um, an old play and calls it the Black Jacobins in 1967 and so on. Tragedies in, in, in French as well and so on. It's also the decade that produces um, uh, Jean Genet's, uh, Jean Genet's um, uh, The Screens produces plays by uh, Wally Soyinka and so on. A great uh, uh, decade of postcolonial uh, writing. And now let's focus for a few minutes on M. Césaire, the Martinican uh, uh, politician and playwright. playwright <coughs> the total 20th century uh, intellectual, <coughs> you name it, he wrote it, you name it in the realm of activism, he did it. Uh, born in 1913, <coughs> died in 2008. The antinomies of Aimé Césaire. As a poet, Dramatist, essayist, intellectual, politician, Césaire supported the anti-colonial black aesthetic that mobilized French-speaking writers in the Caribbean and Africa in the 1930s, which he called negritude. That was the black aesthetic that he um, promoted. However, as a politician, he supported the French assimilationist policy and the process that transformed colonies into departments of France. He was, he supported his own original version of autonomy, not independence, but departmentalization. A, French, a France which will incorporate the um, the colonies as equal departments. Here are his, some of his contradictions, if you will, or his antinomies. While championing the myths and rights of African identity, he thrived in the elite French's, French educational system. 
while exploring primitivism, throughout his political career, he favored departmental integration over national independence. Despite the massive importation of French consumerism into his native Martinique, he continued to argue that cultural autonomy could coexist with departmentalization. And despite the development of Martinique as a distant outpost of the European Union, he persisted in looking to Africa as the source of authenticity. In sum, and I'm uh, quoting John Walsh, Césaire offered and legislated a delicate balance between France and the Caribbean. He adamantly defended departmentalization for its extension of administrative rights and economic protection, but clearly lamented the failure to improve racial and social equality. Departmentalization removed the inequities of colonial law and brought economic protection, but it was also a compromise that did little to improve racial and social equality on the island. So these are the antinomies. So here are some polarities. Blackness versus communism, he was against, <coughs> he turned against, rather. Creole versus cosmopolitanism, negritude versus modernity, myth versus history, primitivism versus na rationalism, local space versus universal values. Being fully aware of these antinomies, of these contradictions, he proposed what he called poetic knowledge, a modern modality of knowing through which antinomies of philosophical rationalists and scientific empiricists are not denied but transcended. Basically, poetry, the poetry of the post-colony will not reconcile the antinomies but transcend them. He believed that writers and artists could creatively anticipate different ways of being free. His great post-colonial tragedy is called the tragedy of King Christophe. He writes a play that he is he self-consciously calls a tragedy. Césaire saw Haiti as the country of the American, in the American hemisphere that best preserved practices and values of pre-colonial Africa that could be recuperated and disseminated by diaspora blacks in a pan-American, pan-African, post-colonial world. So Haiti is interesting both because of it is a modern ex post-colonial experiment the experiment for excellence, but also a tremendous repository of pre-colonial Africa. He says, I love Martinique, but it is an, alien in an alienated land, while Haiti stood in my mind for the heroic Caribbean and also the African Caribbean. I connect the Caribbean with Africa and Haiti, the most African island in the Caribbean, is at the same time a country with a remarkable history. The final black epic of the New World was written by Haitians, by people like Toussaint Louverture, Christophe de Salen, etc. Césaire's engagement with Haitian history informed his strate strategic orientation to politics and his programmatic writings about through decolonization as a revolutionary overcoming of colonialism with indispensable political, socioeconomic, <coughs> cultural, and psychic dimensions. He took a formative trip to Haiti in 1944, long before he wrote his play. He later recalled feeling overwhelmed by the cautionary example of this terribly complex society. Most of all in Haiti, he says, I saw what should not be done. A country that is a terrible, a wonderful resource and yet a model to be avoided. 
a country that had, be, had conquered its liberty, that had conquered its in independence, and which I saw was more miserable than Martinique, a French colony. It was tragic, and that would very well happen to us Martinicans as well if we became independent from France. After writing a book on the historical tragedy of Toussaint Louverture, Césaire wrote four dramas treating the colonial problem as a tragic predicament. The tragedy of King Christophe was written in 1959 to 63, and the premiere was in 64. An absolutely fascinating, wonderful um, tragedy with many stylistic elements, uh, unfortunately, rather rarely performed. Its hero is uh, Henry Christophe, Henri Christophe. Uh, he was a slave, a Haitian slave, who gained his freedom as a young man, rose to the military rank as captain in the colonial government, joined the slave uprising in 1794, participated in many battles, became general in 1802, second to Jean-Jacques de Salen, uh, and when de Salen proclaimed national independence in 1804 and assumed the presidency, he approached Christophe, uh, who was, he, he appointed Christophe commander-in-chief of the army. De Salen is assassinated in 1806, and Christophe is offered the presidency of the Republic. He declines, he secedes. We talked about the dangers of secession earlier, and becomes president of the black northern state of Haiti and pro proclaims himself King Henry I, King of Haiti in 1811. By 1811, Haiti is already not, he has been long in, in civil war, but it is now two countries, one country with two governments. Unpopular for the slave for the for the slave plantation system, which he enforced during his his despotic reign, his idea was, you know, now that we are an independent country and we are free to do whatever we like, w uh, since what we know best is to. Uh, uh, maintain a plantation system. Well, it was colonial, but that, you know, that's too bad. This time it will be our own. So he imposed on his country, on his free country, uh, the uh, colonial plantation system, <coughs> which made him, of course, hugely unpopular, uh, became ill, and then fearing a coup and assassination, he commits suicide in 1820. That's the story that Césaire says in his tragedy. It's the rise and fall of King Christophe, uh, uh, the dictator. Um, In pursuing his avowed aim of upholding Greek dignity before the rest of the world, King Christophe endorses the very values which he is supposed to have repudiated by his act of political independence. His mental paralysis as a dictator king anticipates his physical paralysis at the end of his life and the end of the play. His behavior is more akin to that of a French absolute monarch. <coughs> Manuela Logan says, the play elicits a reassessment of the process of decolonization. In other words, what institutional, cultural, economic, social, and edu educational models, question, what institutional, cultural, economic, educational models should the new nation subscribe to having rejected in theory the ones that had been associated with chattel slavery, dehumanization, and denigration? The genesis of the play, the late 50s, the early 60s, 1950s, 1960s, coincides with the dawning of independence in Africa 
at the hour when the first errors and the first disappointments appear. The tragic beginnings of instituting statehood in the colonized Haiti. Césaire had expected great things from African decolonization, only to see many of the newly independent states turn into dictatorships or military oligarchies. And quoting uh, Wilder, King Christophe reminded its early audiences of several African new states that, having begun as democracies, they had rapidly devolved into military dictatorships. Moreover, Haiti itself had been ruled since 1977, when he started writing, had been ruled by the dictator Francois de Vallée. Césaire, despite his fascination with Haiti, refused to visit between 1957 and 86, when de Vallée's son and successor, Jean-Claude, was ousted from power. In King Christophe, Césaire shows us an extraordinary, capable, and initially well-intentioned well ruler gradually losing touch with his people and by the very means he employs to defend their freedom, becoming their oppressor. This brings to mind Césaire's own words. The black man must be liberated, but he must also be liberated from his liberator. The work is a, uh, um, Césaire's play is a tragedy because it is not a, um, it is not a, a, a condemnation, a critique of an oligarch. It is the rise of a ruler and his people with, as the, the, what I just uh, read, with the best intentions and the best plans and the gradual slide into authoritarianism. How authoritarianism is something that is, that emerges gradually from uh, uh, the regime, from the people, and so on. Uh, and that's what makes it a very powerful uh, work, theatrically as well as politically. And now my brief summary and summary, which is the conclusion. Um, thinking about the future of his native Martinique, Césaire reflected on the question of freedom after emancipation and confronted the antinomies of autonomy. He envisioned a post-imperial republicanism that transcended the alternatives of independence and departmentalization. In his writings, he was less interested in historical figures as tragic individuals than in the world historical circumstances that conditioned their attempts to convert formal liberty into substantive freedom after the end of colonial rule. Césaire's Caribbean may serve not only as a symptom of tragedy, but as a democratic prophecy. A quote from uh, Wilder, to think with Césaire about the problem of freedom helps point beyond the limitations of an anti-colonial nationalism and post-colonial criticism that, for understandable reasons, has largely focused on singularity incommensurability and untranslatability. Untransla Thinking with them, with him about his world and ours may be a step towards producing histories of our now that treat past presents and future's pasts as social facts linked to innovative, if imperfect, political acts that anticipate seemingly impossible alternatives to existing, existing arrangements." Unquote. I began my talk with the challenges of post-colonial determination 
in the 1960s. The central challenge of the new nation states was the dilemma of post-revolutionary autonomy, the effort to reconcile the limitless, that is freedom, with the self-limiting, that is necessity, to reconcile self-authorization and authority, or as Ranciere would say, politics and the police. This dilemma has been discussed often in tragic terms derived from German idealism. Among anti-colonial revolutions and post-colonial predicaments, Haiti has been attracting intense attention. Seeking to approach the antinomies of autonomy from a literary direction, I propose that modern tragedy has dramatized the dilemmas of revolution since the late 18th century, and I focused on the story of emancipation told by post-colonial tragedy. Returning to the 1960s, 60s, my point of departure, I found it remarkable that at that time, theater drew on revolutionary Haiti to write tragedies of liberation. I concluded by discussing a tragic historical figure, writer, public intellectual and politician, a messenger, and his greatest play, The Tragedy of King Christophe. I spoke as a scholar of literature and drew on political theory to explore the importance of post-revolutionary theater for discussions of the tragedy of liberation. And I thank you for listening. And now I can see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Vasilis, for your talk. It was great, very interesting. So let's start now with questions. Yeah, I see a hand <laughs> from Cleoniki. Yeah. yeah please take the mic for the oh. recording. Hello, nice to meet you in person. Thank you very, very much for Thank your you. talk. What a name. Hey, Cleoniki Alexopoulou, yeah. I said, what a name. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ancient Greek, yeah. So, um, okay, I will slightly provoke, uh, as I always do, but since I'm at Luxembourg's house, I think it's worth it. Uh, because what I miss always in uh, post-colonial theory perspectives is material factors. And I want to try, I will try to be as uh, much as possible brief and concise, uh, because it's a bit complicated what I want to say. I will draw from the example you brought at the beginning about Katanga uh, area in Congo, and try to deconstruct these, uh, these uh, dichotomies between, for example, local space versus universal values, these type of, uh, of dipoles, because Katanga is a mining region. So the universal practice in reality there is the surplus extraction, let's say, or the, you know, the interventions of foreign uh, investors, etc. This is the universal practice. So if as a movement, let's say we speak now as a social movement, we support the local movement there, especially during the era of, uh, for example, Lumumba, not Mobutu, not before the dictatorship, then we actually contribute to the, to the continuity not to the rupture, not to the revolution, but to the, to the continuity of the colonial rule. That's what I'm trying to say, that if, if we don't bring in to the discussion material factors, we will always do something like intellectual exercise, like interpretation of past or present interpretations, of other interpre interpretations. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, puzzled with, yeah. Uh, I can continue, but I will stop here I'll and continue, maybe <laughs> come back later. <laughs> I come back later to that. Oh, go ahead. Yes? Yes, please. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. Yeah, I found very, very interesting, just a minor comment, uh, the, the theater as, a, as the place where uh, moments of dilemma are dramatized. Because I didn't, uh, I'm not familiar so much, I mean, with cultural production. I'm more, as you understood, the, into economic and social history. So I like this because I realized why I love so much theater. And I, have, I had never thought of, of this, like that it's the the place of, of dilemmas. Uh, but yeah, in my, in my view, just to, to close it for now, um, these are not, are not necessarily inherently contradictory. I mean, combining uh, even ancient uh, Greek uh, terminology, uh, like tra tragedy, 
or, or uh, like uh, from the era of enlightenment, all this is not contradictory necessarily to uh, freedom and liberation from the colonial rule. And in general, the, the different systems coexisting, I mean different systems coexisting transitions, uh, are known as such uh, since the era of Marx. I mean, it's not such a novel contribution, uh, even, even in the history of ideas, that different systems coexist, like feudalism and capitalism, or you know what mm -hmm. I mean. And, and Gramsci also, I mean, uh, brings that. Yeah, okay. That's it for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> I, you are absolutely right. Um, the the regarding for example the the, the example of uh, uh, Katanga in the Congo the contradiction seems to be rather first um, I spoke as a literature person and therefore as an interpreter of text and that's why I <coughs> the whole thing was uh, 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 driving toward um, a messenger and his uh, and his tragedy. Um, however, I started by quoting various political theories and political scientists precisely because I the uh, situation is as you described it. The contradiction is between the universal claim of the universalist claim of the free Congo and the um, universalist claim then of Katanga. And so the free, the post-colony discovers the contradictions of autonomy, of self-determination. In now that we're a free country, how many people, how many groups, how many regions can claim independence? Can appeal to the universal ideal of independence to uh, separate themselves from the state? That's what makes, I think, many political scientists talk about postcoloniality as a tragic situation because they discover, and the other uh, 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 dilemma that I uh, uh, mentioned was, that they mentioned, was um, internal pluralism, democratic pluralism. How much freedom of opinion, how much dissent can we allow? And so, um, and how free can we be when the people who run the mines continue to run them and influence, if not determine, our economic policy? So the dimension you introduced is absolutely indispensable. Other questions? Thank you. Yes. Because actually, I, I think I was lost in the end of my reasoning. The, the end, uh, the, the final comment I wanted to make is that maybe concepts like path dependency, the fact that one unit, either it's an individual, a society, a community, uh, makes some choices or doesn't, do, doesn't um, it's not their choices, but anyway, there are certain practices, policies imposed in colonial era, for example. The fact that you have this past uh, cannot really, um, not cannot, but, but sets uh, certain limits to your future choices. So you have, you have choices, I mean, as a unit again, either a community or an individual, but they are, uh, they are restricted by, by your past. So I mean, these type of concepts, path dependency from, the insti from historical institutionalism, etc., already, I mean, uh, interpret this, already deal with this, uh, this thing. And there are, there are uh, numerous examples, of course, like, I mean, cotton schemes imposed in Mozambique, uh, the same cotton schemes 
more or less, that the colonial rulers imposed by the communists. And it would happen like this even if they were not communists. I mean, it's not the dichotomy, the dichotomy that matters, like rationalism versus, uh, I don't remember the other uh, end, yeah. Um, it's reality itself, that's what I'm trying to say, that, that by conceiving it in conceptual terms doesn't mean that we can change it. Only maybe if we, if we do radical changes, as you said, if we change the whole production system. That, that's, yeah, what, that's what I mean. <coughs> um, if it were as simple as reality itself, everybody would see it and act accordingly. <laughs> Since people uh, uh, in the 50s and the 60s were so idealistic about independence, and uh, uh, made plans for their economy, for their constitution, for their legal system, and so on, often ignoring the restraints that were still operating. Um, that's why perhaps we need occasionally theater, such as <laughs> the theater, the theater of the 60s. It's, it's very interesting to me that in the 60s there are all these uh, there's all this literary production, theater, poetry, novels, and so on, that introduced the tragic dimension at a time when, for example, um, uh, African, newly emerging African and Asian states can go to the UN and uh, uh, vote for really original, bold, innovative uh, decisions that give them new rights. And yet, uh, Messeser, who uh, is himself a politician. Somehow his literary half thinks, no, this is really dangerous. The, if we look at, if we can, if, if I can put on the stage some historical examples for you, you will see why this is truly risky and it's not going to be so easy. Also, because he incorporates in a play several local and national and international elements and writes a tragedy that is not Martinican, not Haitian, not Greek, but really a tragedy of the, of the 60s. The very literary um, composition of this work invites international, cosmopolitan thinking, broad thinking, because he, he does ex an experiment of his own. How many different, diverse, incompatible elements can I put on a stage? Can I have a tragic hero and have a chorus that is totally Haitian, for example, and things like that? So sometimes literature experiments with political and social um, formations in a bold way. Thank you. Uh, who would like to ask? Someone else? Rosa? Okay, since there is no question for the moment, <laughs> I, I will take advantage <laughs> of this position, and I want to ask you, I was very, I was really, like Leonike, I was really interesting. Uh, what I found really interesting is to think about, to think about revolution or cont like modern political processes through the lens of tragedy. But actually what made me think is that this definitely applies to post-colonial states, but I was thinking to what extent uh, this is the fate of all modernity of all ideological politics. That reminds me a lot of like Kedouri's idea of uh, all politics in modernity are ide is ideological politics, essentially, because it's about principles, it's about how to lead a good life, how to organize society, which is missing from the space that we call tradition. So I was thinking to what extent that can be applied, that idea of tragedy and that idea of how to navigate through contradictions, how to navigate through antinomies for all politics in modernity and essentially for all politics outside the core of the West. 
even if we take to a certain extent the example of the Greek Revolution and the development of that. Or I'm thinking about, of course, post-colonial states like India, where we see the fate of, you know, and this is evolving. It's not, it, revol it evolves as we speak, nativism in, in India, for instance, or the emergence of Islamism in Egypt in the 30s, or something like that. Is it something, I found the idea very useful, and I was thinking whether this could be applied not only in the post-colonial space, but in certain ways, I mean, the whole world after, up until, uh, up until the, the end of the First World War is a colonial space. We've got th th this distinction of the core of the West and the rest of the world is a colonial space. And that's why I like very much you know, the fact that the event of colonialism is constitutive in the ways we understand and we see the world today. So I was wondering whether, I was wondering whether we could extend that concept and to understand all politics outside the West, the fate of all politics. Do I have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, there are uh, quite a few uh, thinkers of politics who, uh, as you suggest, extend the notion of tragedy and the tragic um, beyond certain periods and beyond. Some people, somebody like uh, Castoriadis says that democracy is tragic. In its uh, whether it is ancient or modern or whatever, democracy is tragic. Um, others have said that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Hannah Arendt uh, might say, didn't say, but might say that all politics, that the practices of politics are are tragic. Um, uh, from the other angle. Historians and 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 uh, interpreters of tragedy have said that because it is a genre without continuity, it appears rarely in cultural history. Uh, when it does, they are moments of political turmoil, of political uncertainty. And when we have tragedy in Athens or in Rome or in um, um, neoclassical France or in romantic Germany and so on, uh, or in the 20th century, this is because there are very high political stakes <coughs> that uh, uh, a tragedy comes to, to dramatize. I think given the history of the genre, I think we can often bring it in dialogue with political, with dramatic political developments such as the revolution. In, in um, uh, the, 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 the best tragedy about, about the Greek uh, War of Independence is Kapodistrias, by, I mentioned it by Nikos Kazantzakis, which is exactly the dilemmas of the first years of, and the contradictions and the conflicts of the first years of, um, of autonomy. So I think uh, uh, it's an, an area where political theory and political history and literary analysis can have very good dialogue. Who else wants to speak? Any other? Yes. Any other question? No, Okay, it's not really a question. It actually sort of dovetails with what Rosa said. I was thinking what I'm going to take away from your talk today. I'm an anthropologist, by the way. My name is Cynthia Malakasis. What I'm going to take away from your talk today is precisely what Rosa said, tragedy as a lens to look at different things and to look at the limits sort of not only necessarily grand scale political movements like the, uh, the, the, decoloni the movements of decolonization, but things like Black Lives Matter, 
for example, right? And the freedom versus autonomy um, at the exodo, dead end, if we can, if we can think of it as a dead end. So, uh, like I said, it's sort of a half-baked question. How can we can we use tragedy to to look at the the dead ends and the adifasis, the contradictions of contemporary movements, even Me Too, right? I was thinking more of Black Lives Matter <coughs> or of movements against different contemporary forms of racialization. Arab, Arab Spring. Arab Spring, precisely. So again, it's not really a question. I think that's what I'm going to take away from your talk, tragedy as a lens. My project right now it has to do with uh, the Roma in Greece and the racialization of the Roma people in Greece. So that's definitely, you, you've definitely given me something to think about with the, the tragedy um, trope. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's why I said that starting with that uh, crucial moment in German thought, the, the idea of the tragic, th there was no tragic before, before Schelling and before Hegel, right? Nobody before the German idealist thought that love is tragic, death is tragic, um, uh, 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 dilemmas are tragic. There's only one tra there was only one tragedy on the stage. If it's on the stage, then it's tragic. If it's not, it's something else, okay? But with the expansion that that German philosophy gives to the idea, as well as their own place, of course, Schiller, Goethe, Hölderl, and company, um, we have started talking about the tragic as a quality of life, experience, institutions, and so on, and using it in various ways. And since then, uh, that's why I said I have, you know, three pages of titles by political theorists alone who mobilize the idea of the tragic to describe an institution, a regime, a deadlock, a, a something undecidable and irreconcilable. And often, the theater itself comes in the format of the genre of tragedy to dramatize that for all of us to see and generate several voices and several contradictions for us to say, this is really undecidable. The way, you know, you can't be for or against Medea, or for or against Oedipus. And the same applies with, you know, King Christophe here, or every leader we see on the Western stage, with the whole, you know, uh, with, you know, King Lear, ev everybody, and I'm mentioning, you know, um, well-known works. So, yes, we, for two centuries, we have been calling difficult questions that cannot be avoided or transcended tragic to indicate, especially when we want to keep the options in tension. If I want to say, you know, uh, this historical occurrence, a social movement, a, a rebellion, whatever, um, so hard to decide and let's keep the options open. And so the next time we have, we have a dilemma, we can not rush to conclusion, but still remain to the extent that we can uh, undecided. That's the tragic that we use. Um, I, uh, I'm an actor, so I guess I kind of uh, heard about, I'd like listen to it more from the perspective of talking about, you know, the dramatization. Um, and something that popped into my head as uh, I was listening is that, you know, in all acting classes, they basically tell you that, you know, you have to get what society, not, not, politically or but the norms I guess and what societal structures have informed you in terms of behavior and how to 
uh, move, it, it, all the way down to the way you walk and look at things and think mm -hmm. about things. Um, and I guess what the question that that um, generated inside me was, uh, how, what, what, what role does do social structures and social norms about um, beliefs and behavior and ideologies play in that uh, dichotomy that, in, in that contradiction in terms and in, in supporting the uh, the limitation of freedom? Let me ask you a quick question. When when you say tragedy, other than the ancients, what comes to mind? Um, like in general, yeah. I guess. Uh, on, on, on theater. In theater wise, yeah. I mean, when I hear tragedy, of course, the first thing I think of is the ancients. But I guess, uh, you know, like Tennessee Williams has uh, oh, okay. has mm -hmm. yeah. various plays where I think you know it's just. Okay the reality is what it is and there's nothing you can do about it almost. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what, what comes to my head. I guess what I was, and this might not be the best worded question, but is the, because from what I understood, it was m much more political factors that you uh, uh, touched on and I wanted to also uh, hear what you think about more societal social structures m uh, getting away from the, from the political, if there's anything to touch on there. That's Yes, okay, <coughs> thank you. That's a very useful, uh, uh, an actor's perspective is <laughs> very useful in this, in this conversation. Um, another um, uh, um, conversation that started early in the 20th century was the famous death of tragedy. Meaning, is it still possible or is this like, uh, I think we would all agree, for example, that the epic is no longer possible, okay? Not because there are no epic things, but the epic as a genre is no longer viable. It may return, but right now, nobody is really trying to write a, an epic, epic. Um, what if, the, if, if tragedy belongs to the same category? Uh, the reason being that, for example, uh, this is a Christian world by and large, not a Christian, I mean, it's a monotheistic world, and in monotheism, perhaps tragedy is not possible, in that you are never lost. Your, your faith, if you have any dilemmas, and you do, your faith will solve them. And if you are not a monotheist, if you don't just subscribe to a monotheist uh, religion, then uh, very likely you are a communist or some kind of leftist. And so messianism, political messianism, will also answer your questions. So in today's world, we seek our answers in other areas and don't face uh, insurmountable contradictions. That was one um, uh, idea that uh, various uh, writers advocated. Um, I think at the, by the end of the century, of the 20th century, the matter had been resolved that by the number, of course, of tragedies that had been written that playwrights write works that call them tragedies and uh, critics interpret them as such. So um, if tragedy is still written and viewed, Oh, footnote, theatrical footnote, Bertolt Brecht. Tragedy is not possible because we should not interpret the theater, on the, the actor on the stage should interpret from a distance, should not interpret, <coughs> a person should interpret a role, and therefore uh, there should be no tragedy because if you, if you feel at a loss, then you are not thinking. The strong play is that the one that provides a resolution and you go ho home <coughs> and you know what to do. Uh, and that's good, it has been a, you know, a lesson uh, play. Um, that was another attempt to say, not we don't have tragedy, but we, don't, we should not have tragedy because it's so apolitical. You need critical theater, not emotional. Tragic, 
theater undermines what we think about, about ourselves, what we think about theater, and what we think about life, society, politics, economics, and so on. It's interesting that you even have liberals writing about their tragedy. You would think that, um, I don't know, they have figured out things in a basic way. But today, not even liberals, if, even they write about their tragic uh, dilemmas. So the tragic theatrical experience is really total. And usually, I mean, the best example that I can give is King Lear. You leave King Lear simply devastated, as well as Medea. Medea also, because you can you you can see her point, and you cannot be, you know, for her either. And so, the works that leave you just totally at a loss. And hopefully, you make you also say, that's not theater. We don't go to theater for this. Or make you say, I no longer know who I am. <laughs> you, had, you went to sh and saw a successful tragedy. And the next day, you need to forget about it because you can't live on tragedy. If, if tragedy is really, it's so intense that you can, it's like Nietzsche. That's why Nietzsche went crazy because he was thinking tragedy throughout his life, and you can't live on tragedy. It's too extreme. Other questions? Who would like to ask something? So, OK, I want to ask you something. So uh, <coughs> my question is the following one. Uh, and. You described the, uh, the succession between uh, a, a revolution and a tragedy that, you know, this in modernity goes hand in hand, uh, they are together. And I'm thinking, you know, in historical terms, uh, I would say that, I mean, uh, it is, uh, my comment is, is based upon, you know, to what other people have said here that historically speaking, from a historical perspective, is that uh, a revolution, I mean, for example, let's take, uh, you know, the example of the Russian Revolution, that is uh, the archetype of revolution, is that is, uh, was, a it was a tragedy to a certain extent, it was the quintessence of a tragedy, because, I mean, it was uh, limited, you know, uh, by external factors. So, I mean, uh, the revolution followed by counter-revolution. I mean, there was... I mean, and the, tra the, the, the tragedy was shaped to a certain extent, not only because, I mean, for internal reasons, and you know, how people use the power and misappropriation, et cetera, et cetera, but also, you know, because of uh, a fact that was external and there was not really something was, they decided, I mean, there was not something they could control. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm uh, thinking, you know, uh, your comment that you argued that uh, tragedy uh, emerged especially in um, historical conjectures. I mean, that was, this is, I uh, found very interesting that I wish we could see, you know, the, um, the tragedy as something that uh, emerged as a form in moments that there is a rapture. So it is, let's say, the intellectual response or whatever, to this kind of historical things. And I don't know if you agree with this kind of, I mean, interpretation of uh, sync strategy as, um, I would say, as a um, geopolitical determination of the several events that uh, exist, you know, uh, uh, within a historical context. This is the first question. And the second question is that, I think you replied, but uh, I would like, if uh, the 1821 Greek Revolution was a kind of a tragic event, and uh, if you would like to, to uh, tell us, additionally to Kazajakis, there was 
place because I'm not really familiar uh, on the period, I mean, uh, that followed uh, the revolution, uh, seem that, you know, this was played out as a tragedy. So this is. Thank you. Um, starting with the, the, the second question, one that comes to mind is um, Andara Stanapli, Yorgos Theotokas, which is both, both Kazantzakis' uh, Kapodistrias and Andara Stanapli are written as traditional tragedies with a chorus. They have heroes, heroines, and a chorus. And they are written um, during the Civil War. And so, obviously, they, they uh, instead of, of, of writing something about uh, the contemporary events, they go back to an earlier revolution. Um, it seems that when we have a flourishing of the genre of tragedy, it happens around a political turmoil. However, unfortunately, as it were, every time we have political turmoil, we don't have necessarily tragedy. Okay, so you cannot commission it. Okay, so um, one would expect, for example, the tremendous Russian theater in the, you know, soon after the revolution or between 1905 and 17 to have produced great tragedy, such as Pushkin's Boris Godunov. To the best of my knowledge, it has not, unless it has and they have not been translated. So sometimes we have, uh, you know, Elizabethan theater and Shakespeare and Marlowe and company, and you can say, oh, of course, you know, this is what's happening at the level of um, politics, religion, transition from uh, uh, Catholicism to Protestantism and so on, the economy. Um, but other times you have such turmoil and no tragedy for reasons that I have not explored, but I'm sure they have to do with how at that time theater was done, how it was sponsored, how it was financed, et cetera, et cetera. Theater is not just the playwright, it's the very actual reality of doing theater. And if the reality, the, the, the artistic and cultural reality is not there, nobody will be inspired to write a play just because. So, yes, we miss. Um, uh, when we go to dinner, by the time we're there, I will remember two or three novels that were Victor Sergei. Victor Sergei wrote a novel about, which is comparable to, the great tragic, tragic no Russian novel is uh, The Possessed, The Devils. That's a tragic novel. And everything that <coughs> has to do with anarchist dilemmas in Russian culture is tragic. But for some reason, not on the theater. Uh, yes, the microphone. Uh, another example is the civil war uh, in America, in the US, with uh, Toni Morrison writing afterwards, of course, uh, about it and the freed slaves. It was very similar to the one you brought from Martinique, you mentioned yep. from Martinique. Like uh, one thing is to free yourself and another thing is what to do with your freed self. But in my... <laughs> Like, I, I, I continue thinking like a historian. I'm uh, almost incapable of <laughs> going into this theater <laughs> discussion. But in every civil war you have this, like in every, after every war, 
like a big war, even after World War I, World War II, many, many civil wars come up, and also because of material factors like weapons. They have access to weapons. So, of course, all these situations, the turmoil you mentioned, also after the Greek Revolution, um, they bring uh, many, many contradictions because they bring different social groups um, ad not addressing, uh, confronting each other, like uh, with different interests, with different... So this is the only way I can really understand it. I'm not sure how this, all this, fits into the, into the discussion on the theatre. So, so the criteria is where they play tragedy, uh, where they, they, yeah, they have uh, tragedy plays, theater plays. Wh what is the main question? I mean, wh what is the, the, because I'm trying to understand why basically there are civil wars. Why, what could we do? Should we support the, the, the local movements or the, or the universal movements? Should we, these are the questions that, that puzzle me. But I don't really get what the post-colonial theorists do sometimes through interpretation of theater, literature, etc., bringing up the, the representations, the symbols, etc. What, what is their cause? The <laughs> way I think here we have a, disagree a serious disagreement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cleonic. Yes, <I'm> <laughs> uh, but I'm trying. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the way you put it, there is no need for uh, art, there is no need for culture, <laughs> Because it's all, you know, we know what's happening in all the revolutions, right? And it's the economy, and it's politics, and it's interests, okay? So why bother with <laughs> culture? No, no, sorry. sorry if it sounded like that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. I just need a bigger, uh, maybe, the big theory. I need this epic, uh, at some point, these big ideas, like uh, going beyond yes, you this see, cultural exactly. discussion. exactly. This is what this separates is us. Problem, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want the epic, I bring the tragic. <laughs> okay? If I said it's epic, they get free and they command their fate, of course they have problems and so on. But it's an epic story, freedom, liberation, okay? Taking your, your, your fate in your hands. But if I say it's tragic and so on, that's so dispiriting, right? I mean, who wants to hear this? No, no, it's perfect that <laughs> we, we, we understand, that we comprehend that it's tragic. But let's go beyond. Like for 40 years, uh, after decolonization, we keep discussing the same things, like just deconstructing Because things, if, just you, if, you, if you Google uh, uh, Haiti, mm. if you Google a Haiti October 22, you will see why. Okay. <laughs> because because it's, it's, it's happening. That is, you know, everything I said historically, continues to happen to the extent that there are voices in, in Haiti asking for foreign intervention. And there was an editorial both in the Washington Post and in the New York Times saying, yes, it may be time to intervene in Haiti, to intervene in Haiti. This month. And the interesting exactly thing here is, the, the, the challenge is, you have the people who will say, well, these Haitians, they will never learn. You have others who say, well, had, they, had we stayed there and never left, you know, then, you know, there would be no problem. Why did we leave? They can say in France, okay? Um, others will say, down with uh, this and that and make them free and so um, And so, uh, the, the post-colonial uh, post questions are very much with us. And post-colonial uh, historical record as well as historical books, but also plays, poems, and so on, are part of the conversation and should be part of the conversation. Uh, very soon, uh, Michael Herzfeld's book on postcolonialism, cryptocolonialism, will be coming out, and he's, he has been, um, you know, um, uh, uh, exploring this idea for some time. And so, very, we, some of us are already cr discussing Greece as a cryptocolonial state. Okay. Um, 
And so that whole experience of coloniality in the US where I live through question, questions of slavery that remain very urgent and are, you know, again manifest in this uh, election period. Um, so if we could only learn from history, the world would be so much better and boring. <laughs> Well, uh, just picking up from what you said, I think because you know contemporary material realities are pretty much framed by those dilemmas. They're pretty much framed by the you know when these concepts become reality. Let's say went from abstraction of the abstraction of freedom, emancipation, equality, autonomy. We move to the to the experience of those to the experience of those concepts. I think it makes a lot of sense, as well as discussions at the UN. Yes, all the all, all, all discussions the legal, are framed. The legal, the legal discussions. But I wanted to intervene as as a, not not to intervene, but I just wanted to add because while you were speaking about uh, you know your epic <laughs> your, your your perspective you know your epic perspective and your tragic, I thought also about you know the the comedy perspective in the in the post colonial space, and I was thinking about Naipaul's which is first book, The Mystic Masseur, which actually remind me. Uh, Pasok at the beginning of the 80s in Greece. While I was reading that book, I was fascinated by the idea of people who are, you know, not exactly, but petty crooks who kind of like try to get something out of that situation and grow and grow and grow and they become these big political figures taking advantage of something so familiar. I just wanted to add that, you know, to the genres you have discussed or let's say The Wizard of the Crow, another example of, uh, of great comedy of how things, you know, which discusses exactly the same dilemmas and the same contradictions and the same, you know, tragic, you know, the, the, the realization of, of, of the tragedy of those concepts, the, f the great failures of, of those spaces. So that's all I wanted to say, <laughs> to take into account that genre as well. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I think we are finished. Thank you, everyone, for your presence today. Thank you. Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, <laughs> one minute, just to let tell you that our next session is uh, on 11th, 11th November. Our speaker is Olga Lafazani, and uh, will speak about the significance of border and migration uh, nowadays in Greece. So, see you. <laughs> in uh, two weeks from now.